In the spring of 2010, video of a smoking baby went viral and became an international sensation. Two packs a day this kid goes through. Our person of the year is the Indonesian smoking baby. Have you seen that smoking baby thing? There's a baby that smokes? Yeah. That's not real. But a kid smoking. When the laughter stopped, the world moved on. But there's much more to this story than just one child's cigarette addiction. Indonesia is a heaven for this tobacco industry and hell for us. There's the school sign. Here's the cigarette stand. No, no one has any problem with this. If you thought the public health battle against tobacco was over, think again. Smoking this century will kill a billion people. This is the story of how smoking's decline in the West has fueled Big Tobacco's hunt for new consumers in some of the poorest countries on Earth. They're doing everything in their power to take the same product, the same deceptive marketing practices, and transport them around the world. Why do you smoke Marlboros? I'm cowboy. <laughs> Probably the two most devastating lies in the history of business in the world are smoking doesn't cause disease and we don't market to children. We go undercover to hear how Big Tobacco talks behind closed doors. There's a lot of smokers here. Yeah, this is perfect, perfect place. And we take to the streets to meet the small band of activists fighting for change in a country where the overwhelming message is loud and clear. Cigarettes are cool, cigarettes are fun, and cigarettes are sexy. We set out on a journey to find the world's most famous smoker, a cute kid. And along the way, we found a global health crisis in the making. In Times Square, in the heart of New York City, you find advertising for just about everything. But there's one product that's conspicuously absent from the bright lights and flashy billboards. Cigarette advertising has been all but snuffed out in the United States. Yeah, can I get back a Marlboro Reds? Sure. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, it should be known that I haven't actually bought a pack of cigarettes since I was 15. Now, how much does that cost these days? Uh, $12, sir. $12? Yes. It's quite a lot. Yeah. You heard right. A single pack of smokes will set you back a whopping $12. New York City is now the most expensive place in the country to buy cigarettes. So what did these used to cost? Six dollars when I opened the store. It was like, six dollars when you first opened the store. Now they're twice the price. Twelve dollars. So yeah. That's due largely to a hefty sin tax, levied in recent years by both the city and the state in an attempt to strongly discourage consumers from smoking. Has it hurt business at all? Oh yeah, a lot. Before we used to sell like three cars a day, now hardly one car and we sell. Business Just because it's smoke. so expensive. Yeah, that's why I put a TV on now. <laughs> so you've got something to do. Yeah, that's it. Keep me busy. <laughs> the Big Apple has not been kind to Big Tobacco. And that's a point of pride for Mayor Michael Bloomberg. What the most interesting thing to me is you no longer see a lot of people outside of bars and restaurants smoking. It is few. And when you walk by, they take the cigarette and put it behind them. They're embarrassed about it. A far cry from the way things used to be. From Manhattan towers to towering pines, the Marlboro legend grew. It wasn't so long ago that America was Marlboro country. Come to where the flavor is. Come to Marlboro country. TV commercials like these are evidence of Big Tobacco's glory days. Cigarettes were cheap, costing about the same as a candy bar. You could smoke pretty much anywhere and everywhere. And everybody, it seemed, was encouraging you to just do it. Celebrities were endorsing cigarettes. Doctors were endorsing cigarettes. Even Fred Flintstone was endorsing cigarettes. In the early 60s, nearly half of all adults in America smoked. Business was booming. But the cigarette industry had what many believe was the gall to hide one very ugly truth. It is the only consumer product which, when used as intended, will kill half of its long-term customers. 
Cigarettes are eating you and your kids alive. I have no fingertips. I chose to smoke. This is more indicative of how smoking is portrayed in America today. These graphic images are part of an in-your-face anti-smoking campaign launched in 2006 by New York City's Department of Health. You're one cigarette closer to cancer. The evidence would suggest the campaign is working. Today, 50% fewer kids smoke than smoked eight years ago. Just think about that. It's an amazing statistic. In 2007, the smoking rate nationwide reached a 40-year low. But a global health crisis persists. In fact, the threat is greater than ever. Smoking this century will kill a billion people if we don't do something about it. It is the single biggest killer and the most preventable killer. One billion deaths. And nearly 80% of those deaths will take place in the developing world. That's where big tobacco is headed. In an effort to make up for lost revenue in the US and Europe, the industry is on the hunt for new consumers in some of the poorest countries on Earth. For a Westerner like me, stepping off the plane in Indonesia is in some ways like stepping back in time. Every ad just walking through on every pillar is an ad for cigarettes. The onslaught of cigarette advertisements really starts when you hit the streets. The kind of marketing that has largely disappeared from the West now blankets Indonesia. In my hotel room, I turned on the TV and for the first time in my life, I saw a cigarette commercial. And then I saw dozens more. Ad after ad, tying cigarettes to images of independence, adventure, and most of all, youth. The ubiquity of cigarette ads is not limited to the capital city of Jakarta either. Just going down the road here, there's no escaping it. It's everywhere. Even on the dirt roads of the country's many rural villages, it's the one aspect of the Indonesian landscape that remains constant. Rudy Bihaki works for Child Protective Services in Sumatra, the same island that this little guy calls home. The infamous smoking baby, 40 cigarettes a day. You know what would get the kid to cut back on cigarettes? It's a lesser known treatment called don't give him any. While many saw humor in two-year-old Aldi Rizal puffing away like an old pro, Rudy was horrified and he headed straight for the village where this video was made. What was your initial reaction when you first saw Aldi smoking? Kesal, marah, campur aduk lah semua. So we're sitting here, there are kids around us everywhere. How easy is it for them to get cigarettes? Sangat mudah. Too easy. Too easy. Sangat mudah. Yeah. Eh, dek, belikan rokok sana, dek. Mil, ya. Eh? Sampurna mil. For big tobacco, Indonesia offers fertile and perhaps irresistible new territory. With little or no government regulation of the tobacco industry here, Indonesia is the new Marlboro country. Thank you very much. How old are you? Berapa umur kamu? Berapa umur? Tujuh. Tujuh tahun. Seven years old? Tujuh tahun. Seven. Seven, Seven years Seven. old. Yeah. Indonesia is the fourth most populous country in the world, home to 240 million people, many of whom love soccer and cigarettes. Seventy percent of men here smoke, and you don't have to look very hard to see why that might be. In a country where soccer is king, the nation's professional league is officially sponsored by JARM, one of the nation's largest cigarette makers. And that's just the beginning. So if you can see, this is one of the busiest streets in Jakarta, and this is a huge banner of promotion. So this LCD screen plays nothing but cigarette ads? No. 
24 hours a day. Yeah. And you see that as a skateboard, how cool you are when you have this? Snowboarding. Uh, snowboarding. There is no snow at all in Indonesia. There's not even snow here. And this is for the concert, so oh. they fund the concert. Flow rider, interesting. Yeah. So there's a flow rider event that they're sponsoring. Yeah. If it is not for young people, so who it is for? Ida Rama grew up in a poor village outside of Jakarta. The first time she ever saw a warning about the dangers of smoking was as a 20-something grad student in Australia. As just one in a small band of tobacco control activists, she faces an almost insurmountable task here in Indonesia. Free from many of the regulations and restrictions that have stifled its efforts in the West, the tobacco industry's aggressive marketing in places like this is clearly paying off. One in four boys here, between the ages of 13 and 15, now smokes. How long have you guys been smoking? Three years ago? All right, so when you, when you were 13. So you all started when you were 13 years old. What kind of cigarettes do you smoke? Samporna Miles. Samporna Miles and Marlboro. What kind of person smokes uh, Samporna Miles? Why do you smoke Marlboros? I'm cold. All right, we got a, a regular Marlboro man over here. Anyone can buy, even a child, there is no rule, a child can buy one cigarette from anywhere very easily. In fact, most street vendors here sell exactly that, single cigarettes, for as little as five cents each. Who buys these? Who, who comes in and buys just one cigarette? School children. School children. School children. School children. School children. So do you want to sit the school? Sure, yes. This is the school and this is the school sign. So he is, wow, he's literally school. right in front of the school. That's right. And this is the advertising. There's the school sign. Here's the cigarette stand. No, no one has any problem with this. No. no? In the U.S., like most countries around the world, it's illegal to sell tobacco products to children under 18. In Indonesia, no such law exists. When our elementary school student can smoke, there is no control. When a five years old boy can smoke, there is no control. When uh, babies can smoke, it means there is no control. We have to do something. It's Wednesday night, and I'm on my way to that Flo Rida concert. Thousands of teens have flocked to a sold-out stadium. Cigarette advertising is everywhere. I want to buy my, my cigarette. Hey, 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 hey. She going to make some noise. On stage, American rapper Flo Rida is tearing it up. Flo Rida is now just one in a long list of international artists who have made thousands of dollars performing for Big Tobacco. The Black Eyed Peas, Smashing Pumpkins, Muse, Slash, they've all played shows in Indonesia paid for by cigarette dollars. This man could be called the Don Draper of Indonesia. These days, Mosley, who goes by just one name, teaches advertising at a local university. But for years, he worked for American tobacco giant Philip Morris, running its Marlboro ad campaign here in Indonesia. Big cigarette company, they always think that government sooner or later will come up with new regulation, okay? So they always anticipate from the beginning by doing investment to the young one. That be aware of the brand. Yeah. And be addicted to nicotine. Yeah. 20 years ago, in the U.S., in response to increasing public pressure, Big Tobacco promised to stop targeting minors, even saying goodbye to two of its most beloved mascots. Gone was Joe Camel, a cartoon-like character accused of subversively targeting young consumers. And, perhaps most striking, after more than 40 years of service, Philip Morris retired its iconic Marlboro Man. Mosley is frank, though, 
about who the industry continues to target in Indonesia. As a former ad guy who used to market for Philip Morris, who was your primary target? Young one. Young one. What age? Let's say unofficial, 14 plus. Official, uh, 18 plus. Okay, but unofficial, 14 plus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Unofficial. Unofficial. You know what I mean, right? In 2005, the Marlboro men of Philip Morris paid nearly $5 billion to buy one of Indonesia's largest cigarette companies, Sam Porna. Since then, one of Philip Morris's top priorities has been promoting Samporna's A Mild brand, with its not so subtle tagline, Go Ahead. Philip Morris now spends more than $200 million a year on marketing in Indonesia. According to the company, not one dollar of that budget is specifically earmarked for attracting young smokers. In the marketing practice section on your website, it states, Right. We do not market to children or use any images or content that might appeal to minors. Right. Would you say that all of the events that Philip Morris sponsors in Indonesia follow these guidelines? I'm not familiar with all of the events, but I do know what our guidelines are uh, for events. And our premise globally is that you know, we don't market to kids, and that goes for music events as well. Uh, which is why we try to take great care to make sure that these events are only limited to, uh, to adults. Do you have to leave me? Why don't you just kill me? That sounds like a dubious claim when you consider that one of the company's most recent marketing efforts is a television series called A Mild Live. Go ahead, be the spotted one because Wanted is back. It's the Indonesian equivalent of American Idol. Each week, these wannabe rock stars compete against each other to be named the country's hottest new band. Not only are the shows attended by thousands of young fans, but more importantly, from a marketing standpoint, these events are seen by millions of viewers on national TV, all with the ever-present A-Mild branding on screen. When you look at something like the A-Mild live show, how can you say that that doesn't possibly appeal to minors? I think I think the end of the day, I mean, the, the only people who can actually participate in these events are people who are adults. So, no, I mean, this is not targeted at children in any way. In, in any way. It's an adults-only event. When I watch these concerts, you know, I've seen the, they're advertised on TV, they're broadcast on television. When we run music events here in Indonesia, it's intended for adults. It's intended to be something that we can give to our adult consumers. When we go through the streets, we see billboards everywhere. One brand particularly sticks out, and that's A Mild. The, the tagline is Go Ahead. Go Ahead, okay. Yeah, no, I have seen that one. Yeah. Do you know what that means? I, I don't. I must have been. Sorry. But I can try to find out if you want. Yeah. You know. you know, my first impression of it is Go Ahead, pick up a cigarette. I don't know. <laughs> well, that I'm it? assuming that's not it. But, okay. um, but no, I, I don't know. Sorry. Probably the two most devastating lies in the history of business in the world are smoking doesn't cause disease and we don't market to children. We are against a wall, a tyranny who has a lot of money, who can do anything with their money, but they can't shut up our mouth to saying to the people, smoking is not good for you. They don't have enough money to close our mouth to say that to our people. Ida Rama, the tobacco control activist I met in Jakarta, works for Muhammadiyah, an Islamic organization that has set up schools and health clinics throughout Indonesia. Today, Ida is speaking to teenagers at one of Muhammadiyah's schools about the dangers of smoking. Jadi itu yang ada di paru-paru kita. Dan enggak cuma untuk smokers kita, kalau ngisep asapnya, kita pun kena. When I see a room full of students, I feel they are my future. By the time you get addictive, just like him, it's hard to stop. Her message is similar to what students might hear in health classes in America. 
But there is one very big difference. Unlike the U.S., where for decades there's been consensus about the corrosive health effects of smoking, in Indonesia, there's still debate. Ida has come to the offices of Indonesia Corruption Watch, a government watchdog group, for a highly anticipated press conference. At issue, a clause in a 2009 health bill that labeled nicotine an addictive drug. That clause was mysteriously removed from the bill the night before the Indonesian president was due to sign it. Intervensi industri rokok terhadap regulasi masalah kesehatan dan khususnya masalah rokok tidak akan pernah berhenti. It's widely believed that the tobacco industry coerced three members of parliament to delete the clause out of fear it would lead to stronger restrictions. It was allegedly the second time the industry had interfered with legislation that would have labeled nicotine addictive. Oleh industri rokok sehingga itu merupakan kemenangan industri rokok waktu itu. Do you believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. Even after Big Tobacco's deceptive practices were publicly exposed in the West at these congressional hearings in 1994. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. It is still using the same tactics today in places like Indonesia. They simply try to inject doubt into the public debate on is nicotine addictive or not. Doubt becomes an agent of delay. And delay means selling more cigarettes and ultimately killing more people. I agree that tobacco is not good for the health, but still I demand uh, for the justice for those uh, that depends on this industry. Parliament member Eva Sundari represents a tobacco growing region of the country and frames the smoking debate very differently. For her, it's all about protecting jobs. Why? Uh, these doctors, why these uh, campaigners never bring up this issue. They also say, stop smoking, stop smoking, stop smoking. Nationwide, Big Tobacco employs some 600,000 farmers and production workers, while taxes on cigarettes also bring in roughly $7 billion a year for the government. It's good for the economy and there's a lot of money being generated, but people are dying, aren't they? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, but some millions of uh, lives uh, depends on this industry's tobacco. Philip Morris has been masterful in going from country after country, arguing that their economy depends upon tobacco, ignoring the literally billions of dollars of health care cost. While the U.S. is seeing modest declines in tobacco-related deaths, Indonesia is seeing a sharp increase. Four hundred thousand people a year are now dying of tobacco-related diseases in Indonesia. And these deaths are expected to quadruple over the next 20 years. These are his lungs? Yes. Wow, so this is the tumor. Yes. So how old were you when you had your first cigarette? Uh, uh, eight, years. eight years old. You started smoking when you were eight. You were 12. Yeah. He's still angry. You feel angry? Okay. Were you surprised to learn that tobacco was bad for your health? In a developing country like Indonesia, smoking not only damages the nation's health, it also contributes to poverty. These guys make about $3 a day and spend $1 of that on cigarettes every day. If they're not smoking, they feel sour in their mouth. Do you ever want to stop smoking? Yeah, they want it to stop. 
When Ida was a teenager, her father was forced to choose between cigarettes and sending her to school. So your father was spending more than half of his salary on yeah. cigarettes? That's why he stopped. Can you imagine if my dad didn't stop smoking? I just feel I'm quite lucky. So kita mau ngerubah industri tobacco yang gede gitu, mau ngelarang mereka iklan, susah. Tapi harus melakukan sesuatu, kita nggak bisa diam kalau ada sesuatu yang salah. That's why I am very focused with this um, work because I want uh, Indonesian children also go to school. For our family good and for the next generation. Terima kasih, Bu. Well, it seems appropriate and a little sad that on our road trip to find the smoking baby, we pass a billboard for cigarette company that says, the new generation is born. Tell me a little bit about where we're going. Ini kita ke arah Sungai Lilin. Harapan kita kita bisa ketemu Aldi dan mudah-mudahan dengan kita ketemu dia kita tahu persis. Mudah-mudahan ini nggak terjadi lagi. We're traveling with child protective services worker Rudy Bihaki back to the village where he first came to help Aldi Rizal, better known to the world as the smoking baby. What are the biggest challenges of your job? Dia sangat tidak respect sama kita. Sangat tidak peduli. Malahan kalau bisa kita harus dihapus katanya. You're saying they want to get rid of your job, the guy who's in charge of child welfare. Bukan cuma posisi, kalau bisa orangnya juga. Saya sering diteror. Were you scared? Enggak pernah takut saya. Kemudian saya enggak pernah berteman. Saya selalu sendiri. Karena orang enggak mau berteman saya, resikonya besar sekali. Just across this bridge lies the small fishing village that is home to the smoking baby. And there it was, the one-room stilt shack where that viral video was made. Ironically, in a place where that same video could not actually be seen. There are no internet connections here. Hi. Hi, Aldi. Assalamu alaikum. That's a cute kid. This is the, the kid that charmed the world. One of the most surprising things about the smoking baby video is that all these parents are right there, on their front porch, watching their baby puff away. With all of the media attention, everyone around the world, you know, watches the video of Aldi and thinks, uh, you know, what were the parents thinking? You mentioned before that it might have had something to do with your pregnancy. Kalau dari hamilnya sih, memang saya ngidipnya itu, cuman kan kalau anak-anak yang lain mangga muda. So, did you smoke when you were pregnant? Iya. Yeah. How much? Berapa banyak? Kalau pokoknya sehari itu paling itu paling banyak juga setengah bungkus sih. The Indonesian government was so embarrassed by the international attention as a result of the viral video that they sent Aldi and his mother to Jakarta for a month of cigarette rehab. Just a few weeks out of treatment, Aldi now seems like a normal two-year-old. All right. With a lot of energy and a craving for attention. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter that it's a million degrees outside. Oh, all right, he's buying a little slushy. Mmm. That is delicious. It's coconut. <laughs> 
Today, Aldi's mom is proud to call her son one of the world's youngest ex-smokers. What is it? Don't smoke, okay? Don't smoke. Just a hundred yards from Aldi's home, we found a familiar sight. Just as we'd seen next to that elementary school in Jakarta, here in Sungai Lilin. Right here it says that they're selling single cigarettes for 500 rupiah each. So you can just come in here for about five cents and buy one cigarette. Before we left, Rudy pointed out one last thing. Aldi's preferred brand of cigarettes. Sampurna Mil. Sampurna Mil. Yeah. So these are the ones, huh? In all the uproar about Aldi, few noted that his brand of choice, Samporta Mild, is actually manufactured by Philip Morris. The company that gave the world the Marlboro Man has now generated a new icon. Who do you feel is responsible for all of the tobacco marketing here? Who should do something about it? Sebenarnya orang-orang yang berkecimpung di tembakau itu. Kalau sekarang yang di Sampurna ini kan Philip Morris yang punya, artinya orang Amerika. Philip Morris bukan manusia, tapi iblis. What was your reaction when you saw that video? I think like everybody else, I mean it was just shocking beyond belief. I no, I couldn't believe it. Are you aware that he was smoking a Philip Morris brand cigarette? No, that is the first time I'm hearing that. No, I was unaware of that. But I mean, obviously, it's, I mean, it's unbelievable that a two-year-old can smoke. Um, you know, it, it's terrible, terrible. Do you think that it kind of symbolizes a lot of what's going on in Indonesia right now? I think that would be, I honestly think that would be drawing the wrong conclusions. Okay. I mean, I don't think you can say because of one terrible incident, or, you know, uh, that that somehow can characterize a whole country. The fact is, though, it's not just one terrible incident. Indonesia's child services are now overseeing five other cases of smoking children. And videos of other smoking babies continue to surface. Huge emerging market growth, that's where everybody wants to be. Tobacco stocks, they've been smoking lately. Still smoking. As financial commentators in the media are quick to point out, never have emerging markets like Indonesia been so critical to the future of big tobacco. The story is Asia. The story is the emerging markets. Yes, the emerging markets are doing well. We followed two very good years with a good first half, and we think the year will be good. This is a company with amazing pricing power. The customers are addicted to it. Where are you taking me? Well, we're going to see the World Tobacco Asia exhibition. Back in Jakarta, far from the home of two-year-old Aldi Rizal, tobacco executives from around the world are gathering for the industry's annual trade show. This is the first time Indonesia has been selected to host the event. For Big Tobacco, basking in the glow of record earnings in the region, the trade show is all about press and palms, wheeling and dealing, and maximizing profits in Asia. For a growing legion of anti-smoking activists, it's a chance to make a stand. right outside the gates of the World Tobacco Conference. Uh, this is as far as they're letting the protesters go. Hundreds of people have gathered, all wearing headbands that say against WTA, World Tobacco Asia 2010. People of all ages, it's quite a sight. Why are you here? Oh, I'm a mother with two uh, kids. So I think it is my duty to spread uh, the message to other uh, moms in Indonesia. This industry is not good for uh, people, especially poor people. Conference organizers were only granting access to tobacco-friendly press. We were stuck in the street, wondering if there was any way to get inside. Then, from out of nowhere, the beauty queens showed up. Having taken up the anti-smoking cause, 
several of the finalists from the Miss Indonesia pageant had arrived to confront attendees of the conference and to spread the message that the ideal modern woman is 100% smoke free. The market is expanding now, so it's upsetting actually, and we don't want it to happen. This smoke is not really good for you. <laughs> the beauty queens decided to make an even bigger splash by heading inside, and we followed right past security and into the convention center. It was the opportunity we'd been looking for. I slipped on a pair of glasses equipped with a hidden camera and posed as a brand consultant. We're just moving into tobacco and I don't know that much about it. So like, so women like a milder flavor. I wanted to hear how companies like Philip Morris really talk about selling cigarettes when they're behind closed doors. There's a lot of smokers here. <laughs> and there isn't that much regulation, right? No. Yeah, this is perfect, perfect place. The market here yeah. is one of the few growing markets in the world, you know, for, for to buy. You smoke? No, I yeah. used to a long time ago. Yeah. Everybody will quit smoke. Yeah. I'll be the first to tell you, if you're going to smoke, you might as well smoke Irish smoke the best. <laughs> I also learned how the industry sometimes motivates local salesmen here in the developing world. They need food. You know, we would come up with all these little promotion items, little flashlights, little liars. And you go back to the basics and you say, you know what? If they sell, say, 50 cartons of cigarettes, they want another two pounds of rice or something. After hearing about the effectiveness of rice as a sales incentive, we snuck into some of the formal presentations to see what else we might learn. At the same time, the pageanteers, along with Ida, were being escorted out of the trade show. By any measure, Indonesia is an exciting place to be if you're a tobacco executive. In the emerging regions especially, there is still high population growth. This results in 31 million more smokers in Asia Pacific, around 8 million in the Middle East and African regions, and 5 million more smokers in Latin America. You can't come in, so you need to go out. Yeah, we don't yeah. come in. Because it's a trade event and you don't work in the industry. It is a sort of utopian uh, market for marketers. If your husband worked at a tobacco company, yeah, would you want him to lose his job? No. My husband's not working in the tobacco industry. Exactly, but there's over 8 million people in this country that work in the industry. people who died because of tobacco industry selling cigarettes. There's not, nothing to do with the tobacco industry. It's of machinery. Course it is. Of course it is. The female smokers are rising at a much faster rate. And this has a lot of growth potential as a lot of Asian women start to view smoking as enfranchisement. I have a right to protect my people. They just want to sell, they just want to gain more profit. The tobacco industry hailed its conference as an unqualified success. In fact, organizers have already announced that next year's event will again be held in Indonesia. American investor Warren Buffett once described the cigarette as the perfect product. He said you can make it for a penny, sell it for a dollar, and it's addictive. Of course, in the quarter century since Buffett made that statement, mounting regulations have made that so-called perfect business model a little less so. Seemingly every week, the American media reports on new restrictions. New York City is making its tough anti-smoking laws even tougher. Times Square, now a place where you may not be able to light up. If Mayor Bloomberg has his way, the only place you'll be able to smoke outdoors is in front of a firing squad. Honest to God. But as the grip tightens in the U.S., Big Tobacco is making an aggressive play for profits elsewhere. In the last five years, not only has Philip Morris targeted Indonesia, but they've also acquired companies in South Africa, Colombia, Pakistan, and Mexico. The Holy Grail, a recently inked deal to sell Marlboros in China, home to more than one billion potential customers. They're not going overseas to places that are like America where most people understand the health risk. They are going overseas targeting the kids. 
I understand why the company would want to do that. You go to the people that are most likely to buy your product. I just question the ethics of knowing that your product is killing, continuing to do it. If we stop selling cigarettes here, somebody else is going to do it instead. What I think is clear that if somebody came with a cigarette today and said, hey, here's a new product, I'm going to bring it to market, would it be allowed in the market anywhere? No, it would not. It's a very harmful product, but it's here. If the long-fought battle in the U.S. is any indication, anti-smoking activists like Ida in places like Indonesia have their work cut out for them. They are living in the environment where smoking is normal. But Ida is certain that big tobacco can hide what she believes are big lies for only so long. In Indonesia, we have a saying, when you hide a smelly fish, you can hide it forever because the smell will come out eventually and people start searching, where is the smell? So the tobacco industry is the smelly fish? That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Their lies just like a smelly fish. In the spring of 2011, the Indonesian government had yet to declare nicotine an addictive drug. And it remained legal to sell cigarettes to children of any age. For one of those children, perhaps the most famous one, life is pretty much returned to normal. <laughs> Except when American journalists come to visit. Today, the smoking baby remains smoke-free, and so do his parents. But what will happen as Aldi Rizal and the other children in his village grow up? If current trends continue, we can expect that most of them will one day become smokers. And no one would think twice about seeing a video of a smoking teenager in Indonesia. Yeah. <laughs>